Hi everyone, what a time to be alive. I have three VNAs on my desk, which for a hobbyist is pretty incredible. Uh, just a few years ago or a few decades ago, it would have been completely impossible for someone like me to afford that. But having the same instrument multiple times always raised the question, which one is the best? How do they compare? So what we're going today is compare two nano VNAs with a higher-end Siglent VNA. So the Nano VNAs I have, I have two different versions. This one, I believe, comes from the original creator. It's the SAA2 version 2.2, which is the first revision. This one is a Nano VNA H. Uh, I believe it's a more modern version, but this is probably a clone. And this one is a Siglent SSA 3021X+, Plus, which has been converted to um, SVA 1032X, which is a 3.2 GHz VNA. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to use all the same uh, outside um, test gear, cables, calibrators to test a few different things. I have a VHF, du an UHF duplexer, I have an ADSB filter, I have uh, a VHF antenna and an um, ADSB 1090 uh, MHz, so 1.09 GHz antenna. So we're going to test all of these things with those three VNAs and we're going to compare the results. The software I'm using to capture data from the nano VNAs is called Nano VNA App by 1 of 11. I'm using the version 1.1.208. It's free software, it's open source, and you can connect to different versions of Nano VNAs through the USB port and retrieve a variety of graphs. I have amplitude graphs here, you can also do Smith cards and all that stuff. On the Siglent, uh, I'm just going to use a USB stick and uh, I'll simply export the data from the Siglent directly onto the USB stick. One of the challenges I have when uh, preparing this video is that this software stores the data in its own format and the Siglent VNA stores the data in another format. Even though both files are CSVs, uh, the data in, uh, in those files is not stored the same way. So this is the file I'm getting from the Siglent VNA. Uh, it's a very straightforward format. Uh, basically, it's simply, it's simply a list of all the values displayed on the screen according to the display format I've chosen on the screen. So if on the screen I choose uh, um, decibel magnitude, it's simply going to output that uh, on the file with the first column being the frequency in Hertz and the second column being the data uh, in decibels. So this is very straightforward. I can simply plot that on, on a graph using any tool and it's very simple. On the other hand, however, the Nano VNA software exports just a bunch of numbers. I had absolutely no clue what this was. Uh, so I had to open the source code of the application. Uh, it's one of these situations where the source code is actually the best documentation that I could find. And uh, what I found is that the first two columns are the magnitude and uh, the, sorry, the real and imaginary uh, numbers for the first channel. And the second and, uh, sorry, well, the second set of two columns. So the third and fourth columns are the real and imaginary numbers for the second channel. So basically the first two data columns, it's your S11 in real and imaginary numbers. And the third and fourth columns, it's your S21. Uh, but the problem is when I started plotting that data, of course, it didn't make sense straightforward. I had to find a way to convert that to uh, the same format that I, had, that I had on the spectrum analyzer, which is simply an amplitude in decibels. So thankfully, I found this uh, pretty cool website uh, from um, uh, Roden Schwartz, uh, like an FAQ. Uh, converting real and imaginary numbers to magnitude in decibels and phase in degree. And there's a formula basically that they're, they're giving. And this formula is, uh, is what I've been using uh, to plot the data. In order to plot the data, I've chosen to use GNUplot. GNUplot is a free software which has been around probably for decades. I've been using it for a while. There are other tools available. Of course, you can use whatever you want, even Excel or Google Sheets or whatever you prefer. 
But for me, GNU plot is very convenient. Uh, it offers the capability to plot directly from CSV files. And uh, you can also do a little bit of post-processing on those files, which I'm using here to use the formula from World in Schwartz to convert the data as I described earlier. Uh, so it, I'm just showing the script on the screen right now. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, there are a few sections, as you can see. Uh, I don't promise that this is the best way of doing it, uh, but this has been working fine. And uh, basically the script I'm showing now is the script I'm using to plot the S11 parameter uh, on the UHF antenna as we're going to do um, after in the video. So what I'm going to do first is plot the S11 parameters uh, for this antenna. It's also called the return loss. It's a very common thing to do for people uh, when you want to tune an antenna. Uh, it's very used in amateur radio, uh, for instance. Uh, this is actually a GMRS antenna. And uh, this antenna right here uh, comes from a commercial product and it's supposed to be an ADSB antenna, so uh, 1.09 gigahertz. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use uh, all those instruments to plot the S11 uh, amplitude graph uh, for these two antennas. Uh, so the first step is to calibrate the, the VNAs using the same cables, the same calibration kit. The quality of those really doesn't matter because um, as I said, we are comparing the instruments. We are not comparing the, we are not trying to qualify uh, the calibration kit or the cables. Uh, as long as basically the short behave, behaves roughly like a short, the load behaves roughly like a load, uh, it should be fine. I did check offline, I compared the load in that kit with a few others and they're all uh, spot, spot on. So uh, I, I don't have any concern here. So before starting, I need to decide what measurement parameters I'm going to use. Uh, obviously, I'm going to use the same measurement parameters for all the different instruments. Uh, what I've chosen to do is to measure from 10 megahertz to 1.5 gigahertz. Uh, all those instruments allow me to use uh, 1024 points. Uh, so that, that will basically uh, be the number of uh, samples that I will uh, split between 10 megahertz and 1.5 gig. So I'm going to use that. Um, and uh, yeah, we can get started. So I just connect uh, my two cables to my instrument, just like that. Then I take my calibration kit. Put my uh, adapter on the cable, just like that. And then I go into the instrument, VNA, calibration, calibrate. And I start to do the calibration of the, the first port. So one port calibration, and then I do calibrate. So it's asking me for the open module. So the open module is the one with nothing inside, just like that. And I do enter. Then it's asking me now for the short. So I'm putting the short module. That's pretty standard. Enter, done. And finally, it's asking me for the load. Putting the load, enter and press enter to apply the calibration. All right. So this is done, but since I'm also going later on to do a uh, transmission measurement as to one, uh, I'm also going to calibrate for that. So, whoops, that's not what I wanted. I go to through and I do calibrate and I just connect them together just like that. And then press enter, press enter. All right, it's calibrated completely. Perfect. I just go back, just go back, and we are good. So I'm just going to repeat that on the other VNAs. I'm going to do it offline because it's not very interesting. Actually, maybe not. Maybe you want to see it. So let's do it at least for one so that you can see the process. but basically it's the same process. You do calibrate, um, open, but you actually have to put your open and then you press the button. This is my open. I press open. Short. The load. And 
And then once it's done, connect both ports together, just like before. And I click through. And I wait for it to be done. All right, then I click done. I can save it on the first slot. And then my calibration is complete. So I'm going to do the, the same process for the last VNA and then we'll continue the, the, the video. All right, so all my instruments are calibrated, same uh, cables, same uh, calibration kit, everything the same, same frequency range. Uh, I'm going to start with this cable, which is the um, UHF antenna, and I'm going to look at S11. All right, so I'm going to save that uh, to my USB drive. Save file successfully, great. Uh, now I'm going to do the same measurement, but for the ADSB antenna, which is this uh, cable right here. Going to need an adapter for that, the one I use for calibration. Connect. All right. And I'm going to do the same, save CSV2, that doesn't matter, I'll, I'll rename it afterwards. Enter, save file successfully. All right, good. So now I'm going to do the same measurements, but on the computer for both nano VNAs. Okay, so in nano VNA app, I select the right COM port. How do I know it's the right COM port? If I go to the settings, I can see the firmware information for the nano VNA which is selected. This is a revision 2.2, so it's the red one. Um, and I have all the settings correct. Calibration, I put known because I want to use the one from the nano VNA itself. And then I click this button, play. It does a single scan from all the, the range. It's taking a while, but that's okay, we have time. The curve of interest is obviously the red one, it's S11. And now that it's done, I click on the CSV button and I'm going to save that as a CSV file in my uh, VNA comparison folder. So this is the ADSB antenna and this is the SAA2 version 2.2. SA2.csv. So I'm going to do the same measurement for the GMS RS antenna on this nano VNA and then both measurements on the other nano VNA and then I will show you the results. So during the data capture, I noticed that the data coming from the nano VNA H, the white one, which I believe is a clone. Uh, has an offset of minus 20 dB on the S11 uh, data. However, this offset does not show up on the screen of the nano VNA itself. So I believe it's a bug uh, from the nano VNA dash app software. Uh, so going forward, I'm just going to compensate for it because uh, all other things being equal, uh, it looks like it's just a 20 dB offset. So we have some results, uh, that's pretty interesting. So this graph simply shows the data from the free instruments. Um, and this should be the same in an ideal world. We can see that two of the traces are very, very close to each other, uh, which is the first revision of the nano VNA, the SAA2 version 2.2 it's very close to the data that I'm getting from a sequence, including for the ADSB antenna, um, the valet that we get around 1090 megahertz, which is expected because this is a 1090 megahertz antenna. However, what we can see is that the data from the nano VNA clone uh, seems to be uh, problematic. The, the, the oscillations are much bigger uh, and more importantly, I'm not seeing the peak around 1090 megahertz that I'm seeing with the rest of the data. So that's very problematic. 
uh, because this nano VNA does not see um, what the antenna is doing. Um, I'm not sure what is causing this. I'm also seeing that at the far right of the screen, above 1.4 gigahertz, we have an excursion uh, in amplitude from the nano VNA uh, H clone, which we are not getting from the other instruments. So I tried recalibrating the instrument completely just in case I messed up the calibration because it could have explained that. But even after redoing the calibration completely, I'm getting the same results. So, so far that doesn't look good for that instrument. But let's look at the GMRS antenna now. All right, so we're getting a lot of oscillations on the GMRS antenna. I believe this is caused by the cable uh, because I have, unfortunately, I, I don't have a short cable, so uh, the cable is maybe 10 feet long, so it's probably what's causing this. But interestingly, we are noticing the same pattern as, as before. Both the SA2 version 2.2 VNA is tracking very closely uh, the results of the signal. However, the nano VNA uh, H clone um, is again doing weird things. Uh, I can't really explain it, um, but definitely it's different than the two other instruments. So that again doesn't look promising. Uh, let's do the S21 measurements now. So the S21 measurements is the transmission uh, measurements. So we're going to look at filters and duplexers. For the next part of the video, we're going to look at this duplexer and this uh, filter. Uh, duplexer, very quickly, it has basically, um, this one has a low pass and high pass filter. It's used to use, for instance, um, two different radios with one dual band antenna. Um, or you can also use that for repeaters if you want to do a crossband repeater. Um, but yeah, so one port is rated at 1.6 to 150 MHz. So that's what's going to go through those two ports. And the other port is rated 400 to 460. So that's going to go through those two ports on the right. And the other one that I have is an ADSB filter from FlightAware. Uh, it, it's used basically to eliminate uh, interference that you may have that might saturate the front end of uh, ADSB receivers. Um, so it's supposed to be a 1090 megahertz or so 1.09 gigahertz uh, band pass filter. I, I don't know how um, narrow it is. If I recall properly, it's not a um, SAW filter, so it should be pretty wide, but we're going to test that. So I have connected um, the VHF port of the, um, let me tighten the connectors properly, all right. I've connected the VHF port of the duplexer to the, um, the signal source basically of the VNA and the output um, to the, the other part of the VNA. And, and we, we are seeing what, what we expect. So basically we have a very low uh, loss uh, for frequencies below, um, that should probably be around 200 megahertz. And then the losses uh, increase sharply. Uh, and basically above certain frequencies, they are always above 40 dB. So that's a pretty good isolation. So I'm going to save that data, uh, do the same measurement on the other VNAs, and then we're going to compare the results uh, with the um, common graph uh, and see if we see interesting things. After testing the ADSB filter, the results didn't disappoint. Uh, we again have a very close uh, match in terms of results for the SAA2 and the Siglent. However, the Nano VNA Edge clone is really bad. Uh, why, do, why am I saying it's bad? It's not bad in the sense that it's completely unusable because we can see the bond pass between approximately 900 and uh, 1.2 gig but there is a lot of uh, amplitude variation um, outside of that, a little bit uh, on the lower frequencies and above 1.2 gig. Uh, there is a very significant difference with the other VNAs uh, up to one, two, three, four, almost 50 dB difference at 1.4 gig. So that's really, really significant. 
Uh, I don't know yet what causes this, but um, it's very concerning. Let's see if we get similar results uh, for the duplexer. Yes, we do. <laughs> so again, uh, we can clearly see uh, the low pass filter aspect of the duplexer, uh, basically below approximately 250, 40 megahertz. Uh, we have a very low loss. What is interesting to see here is that the SAA2 registers quite a bit of insertion loss um, at those low frequencies, approximately 4 dB, whereas the Siglent or the Nano VNH clone doesn't see that insertion loss. However, uh, after approximately uh, 300 MHz, uh, we again have a very close relationship between the SAA2 uh, version 2.2 and the Siglent, and the Nano VNA, VNA, Nano VNA H clone is completely uh, showing noise, I would say. Um, yeah, so that, that's interesting. An interesting test to perform is the isolation test. So I'm connecting a load uh, to the, I would say, input port of the VNA. And this is going to show me on the screen the noise floor of the instrument, uh, depending on the frequency. So we can clearly see that uh, there is a significant amount of difference in terms of the noise floor uh, for the low frequency and the high frequencies. Um, there is a very visible uh, jump and above that it keeps climbing. And if I do the exact same test on the, the SAA2, we can see that the noise floor stays consistent uh, across all the frequency range, the same 10 megahertz to 1.5 gig range. So that's pretty interesting. And of course, for the Siglent, uh, it's the same. Uh, we see a relatively low noise floor across the, the full frequency range. So we can also plot that data and uh, not surprisingly, we can see that both the um, SAA2 and the Siglent have a low noise floor, but the Nano VNA H clone uh, really doesn't. Uh, just before people start screaming at me, yes, the Siglent can have a better noise floor than the SAA2. The reason why the Siglent doesn't have a better noise floor here in this picture is because the scanning rate uh, that I've configured on the Siglent is much, much, much faster than the one uh, on the SAA2. So that simply explains why the SAA2 seems to perform better here on this graph. So what's going on? Why is this instrument better than this one? Um, can we tell? I think yes. Uh, if we look at the construction of this instrument, uh, besides the blinking lights, which make it uh, look like a Christmas tree, it's pretty interesting. We can immediately see that we have two shields on the bottom. And uh, similarly, internally, I'm not sure you're going to see it on the, on the video, but we also have one shield on the right here and one shield on the left here on, on the rear. Whereas on this instrument, we have absolutely no shielding whatsoever. So the battery here, it's not a shield. Um, so what I suspect is happening is that uh, there is simply electrical noise that's getting into um, the... Uh, input of the VNA and unfortunately what I'm suspecting also is that this electrical noise uh, is damaging the, the other measurements too. So uh, that's the problem uh, I would say uh, with this type of lower quality instrument. Uh, it seems to work, it's based on the same schematics, uh, it's based on the same components but uh, the devil is in the details and I strongly suspect that the lack of shields is causing the issues here, especially since uh, that we see that at lower frequencies, uh, this instrument seems to be behaving properly, but as soon as the frequencies get higher, uh, we get results which are essentially meaningless. So that's something to keep in mind if you're looking for uh, a nano VNA, try to get one from a good seller, uh, preferably an original one from the original creator because obviously they know what they're doing. Uh, but at the very least, try to get one which is properly shielded uh, because otherwise you, you, it's very likely you're going to run into those issues. I, I would say that despite uh, this instrument being a earlier revision than this one, uh, I would say this one is basically unusable. I cannot trust it. Uh, whereas this one, based on the comparison we've done with the Siglent, which is a, obviously a much better instrument, 
uh, this one tracks it pretty well. So this one I, I would trust. Like if I'm on the go, I want to check an antenna on the go or uh, a mobi mobile antenna in my car or whatever, I would definitely trust this instrument. Uh, it's definitely not as precise though as the Siglant. We have seen some interesting side effects. For instance, when we were measuring uh, the duplexer, um, this SAA2 was seeing an insertion loss which wasn't there. So I don't know why, uh, it's definitely interesting. Uh, I don't believe it's the, the connectors that do that. Uh, they, they were tight and also we wouldn't see it on, on this. Uh, one thing that could explain it, those instruments are actually based on a, a clock synthesizer, uh, which works, if I'm not mistaken, un until 300 megahertz approximately. And there's a transition above which uh, the instrument is operating on harmonics. So maybe uh, it's operating differently. Well, it is operating differently below approximately 400 megahertz. And maybe it could explain the difference of performance. Uh, but I, I don't know. 3 dB uh, is pretty significant uh, in terms of uh, measurement error. So I would really like to understand what's going on. The problem, unfortunately, is that because this is the first revision, it's no longer supported by the creator or by the other firmware uh, developers. So I wasn't able to find a newer firmware version. This is a firmware from 2020. Whereas for this one, uh, there is a much more modern firmware revision with a lot of bug fixes, additional features, and, and, and so on. So that's the drawback uh, of this one. I would say the newer revisions, the latest revisions of the Nano VNA that have been released recently, they go higher in terms of frequency. Uh, they are well supported, so that could be a good option. Uh, but for this video, I wanted to use what I had because now that I have the Siglant, I'm not going to buy another Nano VNA. Uh, but this one, I think I can scrap it. This one I'll probably keep. It's still a useful instrument. Uh, but of course, I very much prefer the Siglant. Uh, maybe I'll have a chance to do a video on the Siglant uh, if there's interest. Uh, but yeah, I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, I hope it will answer some questions that people have regarding uh, the Nano VNA, if it's good or not. Um, definitely, we can see that some are good, some not so much. And we had a chance to compare three instruments, which is pretty cool, because if we only had two, uh, if they didn't agree with each other, we could have uh, made the assumption that the signal was better, but it would have been difficult to draw a conclusion. But here we clearly have two different instruments that agree with each other and one that doesn't. So that really tells us there is something going on with that other instrument. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, see you next time.